The United States feared that Chinese would begin to use the island as a stepping stone to U.S. shores. So when the U.S. occupied Cuba from 1899 to 1902, it applied its own anti-Chinese exclusion laws to Cuba. Um, so shortly after Cuban independence, tension between these two seemingly opposite discourses took root. One that it had imagined them as an essential part of the fabric of the Cuban nation, and another that portrayed them as something exotic and alien, and in a more aggressive form as something that was dangerous to the Cuban nation. Elite Cubans preferred white European immigrants to help develop the new country, and this led to more anti-Chinese regulations. So in this public discourse that we see in newspapers and images, um, Chinese were portrayed as a yellow peril to be avoided, and this is along with Afro-Caribbean migrants, particularly Jamaicans and Haitians. But in 1917, the Chinese labor immigration to Cuba was officially reinitiated um, because planters needed workers to boost sugar production during and after World War I. Um, and this time, Chinese came no longer as indentured laborers, but they were free. Um, they, free men who may have initially worked in the sugar in industry, but then quickly moved into other occupations. Um, so tens of thousands of Chinese came to Cuba during these first decades of the 20th century, most of them men, as in the 19th century. And this portion of a mural in Havana's Barrio Chino shows this quintessential image of a Chinese peddler, but also their associations with gambling and other cultural traditions in Cuba. Um, like the 19th century, most Chinese migrants to Cuba continued to come from the Pearl River Delta region of Guangdong province, especially four counties of Taishan, Xinhui, Kaiping, and Unping, as well as nearby Zhongshan. And more than half came from a single county, from Taishan County. And this is uh, parallel to what was happening in the United States. Many of them were able to maintain transnational ties to China, and they've left an indelible imprint on the countryside in Guangdong province. Um, so in addition to sending remittances to families, Chinese in Cuba also shaped local society by building railroads, hospitals, schools, ancestral temples, and houses. Um, the two and three story houses built by returned Chinese overseas display Western architectural traits, and watchtowers like this one in Kaiping loom over villages to guard newfound wealth. Often one son would remain in Cuba to learn the business, and another was sent to Hong Kong or Guangzhou for education. And these children would be immersed in Chinese language and culture for a period of time, then return to Cuba with new skills and a sense of maintaining a connection to an ancestral homeland. Um, while in China, they would associate with students from other foreign countries. And they, the Chinese from Cuba who were educated abroad were often grouped together with other children from places like Panama. Um, and this potential then for a collective overseas Chinese identity was fostered. By 1920s, uh, Chinese had formed bustling communities in Havana, where this photo is taken from, and other provincial towns across the island. Um, and Havana's Barrio Chino became one of the best known Chinatowns in the Americas. Its blocks were lined with restaurants, bodegas, laundries, shoe and watch repair shops, bakeries, photography studios, and pharmacies. And there were also ethnic institutions, uh, mutual aid associations, theaters, four newspapers, a cemetery, two bilingual schools, a hospital, and a residence for the elderly. So a typical Chinese immigrant in, in Cuba would belong to a Chinese fraternal organization, read Chinese newspapers, donate to China's resistance against the Japanese occupation, in World War II, and attend Cantonese opera performances. Um, and this is an image of a typical uh, large transnational Chinese business. Um, the early 1930s became a period of intense nativist politics in Cuba, where there was more restrictive immigration legislation and also a nationalization of labor decree 
aimed at um, foreigners. Um, in order to defend their community, um, the Chinese merchant, merchant uh, community founded a magazine known as Fraternidad to promote the image of the Chinese as integrated into Cuban society and also as an uh, integral component of Cuban national identity. And this magazine had a section in Spanish in order to reach a non-Chinese audience, um, but it also had a section in Chinese that would report more on homeland issues. Um, and its pages were filled with images that showed both the Chinese community in Cuba and their homeland in a favorable light. Um, so for example, there'd be uh, photos of uh, baptisms and weddings, especially with Cuban women, to underscore this idea of Chinese integration into Cuban society. Um, at the same time, uh, Chinese Cuban merchants um, wanted to demonstrate their contributions to the economic vitality of the nation and were demanding equal treatment of other foreign merchants while these anti-Chinese exclusion laws were still in place. Um, they, they frequently demanded a change in Cuban policies, and in doing this, they distanced themselves from the lower classes of laborers and clerks and from the stigma of the earlier Cui period. They also subscribed to a prevalent racial thinking in Cuba, confident that their upper class position could confer an honorary white status upon them. So for example, Gustavo Chue Beltran, was born to a Chinese merchant and a black woman of, so, of lower socioeconomic status. Um, Chinese business associates had pressured his father to change his birth certificate in order to strip his mother of any parental rights. And it wasn't until many years later that Chui was able to reconnect with his mother. And he eventually became a general in the Cuban army, and his story is featured in a recent uh, memoir of Chinese Cuban generals. This case demonstrates the influence that Chinese men could have on family formation and also the pervasiveness of color within the overarching concept of Cubanidad. Um, and we also see examples during this time, 1940s, of Chinese petitioning the courts to have their children's birth certificates changed from mestizo or mixed to whites. Um, I also want to emphasize that most Chinese in the so-called merchant class, who were labeled that way in official documents, were not in these upper strata of Cuban society. So even small vendors could maintain ties back to China. Um, so one of the stories that I feature in my book is that of the, the Lui Fan and his family. In 1918, he came to Cuba, along with fellow villagers who had the same surname, to work in sugar fields. Um, and he eventually became a peddler, and actually after a couple of months. Um, and he would carry two baskets of vegetables on a bamboo pole balanced on his shoulders. His, um, he lived in Cienfuegos, not in Havana, so in the provincial town of Cienfuegos. And he didn't live in a Chinatown, he lived in a Cuban neighborhood. And his Cuban neighbors knew him as Francisco Luis. During his uh, return trips to his hometown in China, um, he built a house, he married, and he had two daughters. He never saw his second daughter in person, but he named her Mali, after the Western name Maria or Mary. Um, he never did return to China and left his two daughters to grow up in the village in China without their father. Both of them eventually married and had families of their own, but they maintained his ancestral home and also maintained contact with him through letter writing and also by receiving the annual remittances. Eventually, though, Lui Fan settled in Cuba and developed a relationship with a Cuban woman. They also had two daughters named Lourdes and Violeta. When their mother abandoned the family after three years, Lui Fan became solely responsible for their upbringing. He was sure to give them Chinese names, Gui Gui and Gui Po, which he had inscribed on their school, school bags in this image. And he also encouraged a relationship between these Cuban daughters and his Chinese daughters by sending photos and writing letters on their behalf. Um, so Francisco Luis, or Lui Fan, 
played an active role in shaping conceptions of family for both sides, but for these mixed Cuban daughters, shaped their, their link to China, um, even though they, they hadn't been to China. He raised them in Cuba in a strict Catholic environment, but also taught them complementary points in philosophies of Confucius and Lao Tzu. When Lei Fan died in 1975, the correspondence between the four sisters had stopped. Um, so in 2001, when I was working on my uh, dissertation research, I embarked on a journey to try to locate Lei Fan's family in China. And with the assistance of the local overseas Chinese affairs office, I was able to meet both of his Chinese daughters, Bao Qin and Mali, who are on the left, and um, as well as their children and grandchildren. So the communication between these Chinese sisters and their Cuban sisters resumed after over 25 years. And this time the grandchildren took an active role in translating and in sending email messages. So English kind of became the, the lingua franca. Um, so as we know, many Cuban youth dream of going to the United States and meets the Espinosa Luis, who is the granddaughter of Lui Fan, um, had always wanted instead to go to China. So in May of 2009, this is before the recent reforms and when it was still very difficult to leave China to get the official, I'm sorry, to leave Cuba, to get that official permission from the government. Um, so in 2009, an international conference in, in Guangzhou provided this opportunity and we were able to bring Mitzi Espinosa Luis to China to meet her Chinese relatives. So we hired, um, we hired um, a minivan and descended upon her village. And Francisco Luis's two Chinese daughters had both died since my last visit. But this time their husbands, their children, and their grandchildren gathered at the entrance gate to meet Mitzi for the first time. And they showered her with hongbao, the red envelopes for good fortune, um, and questions. And, these, and questions and commentary was filtered through Cantonese and Mandarin to English and Spanish. Um, we visited his ancestral home, and this is the village. And one of the things we found in this ancestral home, which no one keeps but the family still maintains for ceremonies, was an old trunk with the initials FL. Um, and the, uh, I recall that the family said they always had wondered what was in this trunk and what the initials FL meant um, because they knew him as Lui Fan. And Mitzi said, oh no, that's Francisco Luis. That was his name in Cuba. Um, so a mystery was solved. And we opened up the trunk and in addition to some dust coming out, um, it was actually some old clothes from probably from the last time he had visited. So Western style hats and suits, kind of his best clothing that he had brought back with him from Cuba. And as we know, a lot of this was um, influenced by US styles. Um, I don't know if I can get the audio on this, so I'll just show the, um, the images. Um, when we went back to the home, um, Mitzi Espinosa made an offering at the family shrine in China, and this is their tablet. And the tablet um, had always had the names of the Cuban side of the family in addition to their Chinese side. Um, and then any of you who have had these kind of family reunions know that um, there's a tradition to take a a, uh, a family portrait at the village gate or in front of the home. But this kind of photo really belies the chaos and the confusion that came out of the different languages and, and cultural traditions. We had you know, man, uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, English, and Spanish floating around. Um, and so the story, I mean, one of the things I want to point out is just that this story, these, these life narratives, really point out what we can't quite capture in some of the archival documents and the, the uh, official recorded history of the Chinese Cubans. Um, and it also points to the, the fact that this is an evolving history that is continue to, continuing to sh take shape, especially now as there's opportunities for more immigration to Cuba in the future. 
um, if, if things continue to reform. Um, and then just on a, on a larger note, um, this kind of research that I think everyone here is doing really complicates our ideas of race and nation and citizenship in Latin America and the Caribbean. These are topics that have been dominated by the presence of Europeans, Africans, and indigenous, and scholarship that's been written about the interplay between the three. And the Asian presence has always been there, really since the 16th century, but especially since the middle of the 19th century. And so this kind of work, I think, is bringing out the significance of that presence in different ways. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Dr. Duani and the Cuban Research Institute and to my fellow panelists. This has been an exceptionally prideful and gratifying event to be a part of, not especially because it's at my alma mater. Um, let me change over the PowerPoint. Thank you. And I will be continuing some of the discussions that Professor Lopez has brought about by talking today about the Chinese in Cuba post-revolution, post-1959, and I'll be introducing to you some of the stories and religious uh, research that I've been doing that also troubles these discussions because they, they provide another sense of Chinese-Cuban community making, identity, and transnationalism. Just one second. So where are we with the Chinese in, in Cuba from their indentureship to several migrations inside and out? But I'd like to start by first acknowledging that with the with revolution, many, many Chinese did leave the island. And they didn't just go to one place, but they circulated as, as Chinese all want to do. We don't stay in place for too long. Um, so many Chinese left at the beginning and continued to leave to the Americas, to Europe, to other parts of the Caribbean as well. Um, and so what we're left with are not so uh, many in-migrations to Cuba with, with the Cuban Revolution. So we really find a static sense of Chineseness. So there are no new native Chinese coming in to replace or to augment those that are leaving. And what we find is that there is a growing community of mixed race subsequent generations of Chinese, Chinese Cubans, Afro Chinese, however you wish to depict them. They could look like me, they could look like any one of you here. And many have Chinese descendancy somewhere in the lines, and they're very proud to tell you of, of that descendancy. So uh, I've just put some information here about that, which I should have perhaps had in, in front of me so I could share that with you. Um, more, uh, in a more, there's, a, there's a conservative estimate of uh, 100,000 uh, Chinese Cuban descendants, but it really is meaningless. There, there aren't any real figures, just as there aren't any real figures of the numbers of Chinese Cubans that have out migrated from, from Cuba. And I wanted to give you a sense of some of these hidden or misunderstood histories of. of the Chinese in Cuba. Many of you are familiar with the saying that if you're sick and not even a, a Chinese doctor could cure you. Well, that has its roots in actual events, and it happened with the Wars of Independence and of one particular Chinese doctor called Chang Hongbian, who it has become a mythical figure. He has uh, become almost the Robin Hood of medicine, where he would treat anybody that would come to him, and he was from Coliseo, and he's now interred within the uh, Cemetery of Colón in, uh, in Havana. And his site, his grave, his tomb has become a, a site of, for people to come and pray for health and pray for cures. And they've also, uh, that has it spread. It spread to other Chinese doctors that have passed away. So now the Chinese cemeteries in Havana have put a moratorium on any offerings being left at Chinese graves because it produces Rats, it produces in, you know, an influx of, um, of vermin that come in. So 
those have, those have been stopped, but it does give you this sense of the idea of the Chinese in Cuba and almost um, a visceral connection between who the Chinese were an identity that's of healing and of power that doesn't really get recognized within these discussions of indentureship, hardship, of merchant classes that, that, uh, that we have been um, known to do. And we also have been talking a little bit about location, place. Havana's Barrio Chino, uh, Maria mentioned it was the largest Chinese Chinatown in the Americas and its role has been changing in Havana uh, because of these out-migrations of native Chinese and because of the very dwindling and aging populations of those that were born in China but still residing in Cuba, which are estimated between 200, 400, 500 still left, and we get different measurements by different Chinese associations that are still active. And there are 13 active associations, including um, the Chinese Masonic Society that has its roots back to the 16th century and has branches all over San Francisco. And so Chinatown's physical landscape is changing, but also its cultural landscape is changing. It's welcoming in a lot of uh, Chinese investment. It's being, the changes in revitalization are being led by mixed race Chinese Cubans and also of Cubans without Chinese descent and it's becoming a place of culture but of Cuban culture and of commerce. So right now we have, and it has been happening for a long time, a great influx of uh, native young Chinese coming in to study. We, and they're studying medicine, biomedicine, they're coming for tourism, for language courses, and there's also an influx and an exchange of medicine, commerce, and trade between the two socialist nations of China and Cuba on a grand scale. It's happening in biopharmaceuticals, oil and gas production, prospecting. Uh, within Cuba's waters on the Gulf of Mexico, there seems to be about nine billion um, barrels worth of oil that they are currently prospecting for. So there's great opportunities that the, the Chinese and the Cubans are looking at together. And Chinatown is becoming a site for these negotiations and also to, to show that uh, there is this Chinese presence in Cuba. And this is just a photo of one of the entrances to one of the most popular districts within Chinatown. And uh, the restaurant on the right is actually owned by the descendant of the uh, martial artist that brought to get brought to China, uh, sorry, brought to Cuba, the lion dance for the first time in the 1950s. And this is Casino Chunghua, the inside, which is one of the most important, if not the most important, outposts and Chinese associations. It was mentioned in other and images were shown, but this is how it is today. And for many, many years, this association acted as a de facto outpost for Chinese influences and Chinese um, letter exchanges. Casino Chunghua are responsible for repatriating the bones of deceased Chinese Cubans back to China as the family wishes. And it acted for many years as an embassy and as a consular. <coughs> This is just another uh, view of it, and in the, in, the, in the back you'll see a small library because it was also connected to the Kuanghua Po newspaper, which is the Daily Shining Star uh, Chinese language newspaper, and it remains, it, it's really not so much in, in production today, but it was the only non-state-owned uh, publication in Cuba from the start of the revolution. And this is one of the other associations that I mentioned, the, the Michi Tang, which is part of a Chinese secret society that some would, would label it as, and it's founded by five Shaolin monks, and it has branches worldwide. This is their grand meeting hall, and the, the, the colors of the flag show the, show, um, the five Shaolin monks that um, founded the, the association. And most of these associations are a mix of cultural, 
and small commerce ventures in order to keep going. This Minchin Town acts as a, a daycare for elderly Chinese for its two to three hundred members. They receive a meal every day of the year, uh, breakfast and a, and a lunch which they take home. And this is also where they spend their days um, reading, talking, watching Chinese language movies. And this is a scene of the newly refurbished restaurant that's attached to it in order to attract tourism, money in order to enhance the culture activities and the elderly daycare. And I like this picture because it's a fish tank with a bird cage inside it, uh, as, as to the principles of feng shui. And going back to the Casino Chunghua, this is one of the statues of the deity known as Sanfang Gong. Um, or Guan Gong, or Guan Di, Lord Guan, uh, one of the mythical heroes, he was a warrior, and he really became uh, one of the national and symbolic heroes of Chinese Cubans, but also he's found circulating around the Caribbean and around worldwide. You probably see a smaller image of this red-faced deity um, in restaurants here in Miami and elsewhere. And this is one of the earliest um, 19th century statues that is still housed in Casino Chunghua and he not only is seen as a Chinese deity but he becomes Chinese Cuban in his um, in his makeup and that happens across the board not just with with uh, San Fan Kong but with all of the deities of Afro-Cuban religion so San Lazaro which I decided to pick because December 17th is his feast day and that became significant recently with President Obama's talks and opening up of negotiations and normalizing of relationships with Cuba. And the Chinese recognize San Lazaro's image, which is the Catholic counterpart, with the Chinese deity Li Suan or Iron Crutch Li. And both of these deities are about miracles and healing. And this is just a small statue within a Chinese Cuban home. And moving away from Havana, I wanted to give an example of how Chinese Cuban religious sentiments come together in new, in new ways, in new formats. So you're seeing San Fan Gong, which is the Orisha Chango, which is also at, at times the Catholic Saint Santa Barbara. And you see in this Cabildo, this, this fraternity, this association, images of African stylized chango in the middle, carved of wood. You see Santa Barbara Achinara, these, these beautiful um, handmade dolls of Santa Barbara because the worshippers are of um, Afro Chinese descent. And then in the middle, you see an incense thurible and um, Chinese altar candlesticks. And then moving over to uh, Sawa La Grande, which is very close to Santa Clara. I found this uh, cabildo, again, this incredible Afro-Cuban household that was founded by and for Afro-Chinese descendants. Sawa La Grande happens to be the birthplace of Wilfredo Lam, and his, um, his godmother knew of this cabildo, it was still standing there. He's, he, he was interested and initiated, some say, within Afro-Cuban religion. And this is the statue that was shipped over. It was commissioned in Spain, uh, mid 19th century, uh, sorry, mid 20th century. And that is the photo of the founder, along with the manumitted slave, Basilio Rasco, who came from Africa with, uh, with Django May. This is Luis Chis Odomi Wale, a priest of Yamaya, who inherited the this organization, that's his Orisha Yamaya, and then we have Ofun Yobi, who was his uh, inheritor of the Gabildo, of this structure, of this cultural center, and just around the time of the revolution, it, this was the place to be. It courted politicos, it had local celebrities, every year they would have lavish celebrations for the deities, both within their African and within their uh, Catholic counterparts, but also because of the Chinese influence, they also have a, a great deal of Chinese tradition inside. This is a picture of how it is today, or perhaps how it was a couple of years ago when I did my research. I, I don't know if it's still standing. You'll see the insignia of Chango, the double-headed axe. You'll see the um, 
palm fronds above the door, but as you can see, it's seen better days. This is a very short video, five seconds, I think, of the, um, let me see if I can play this, I'm sorry, I'm not used to this um, video, if you could just play this five seconds to show you the, 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 the focal point of this, this cabildo was this Santa Barbara statue, which was imported from 1951, I believe, and this remains in the only roofed part of the association, and it really was something that was celebrated each year on December the 4th, it was paraded in the town, and that just gives you a little, little glimpse of the, of the um, glamour. And this is the current custodian of this cabildo, Luis Chis. And he is also of Chinese Cuban descent, and he is the child in the arms of Odomi Wale and Ofum Yobi, who you saw in, in the past photos. But what's really interesting about this photo, apart from the characters, is the tree that you see behind it. It wasn't just taken there by chance. That's the tree. Does anybody recognize what it is? Good guess. It's a tamarind tree, which is also sacred to Chango, San Fan Gong, and by extension, Santa Barbara. And Luis was telling me that just before the revolution, a, a bull, un toro, was sacrificed to Chango at the foot of this tamarind tree every year of December the 4th. And again, with the revolution, it became illegal. I, I'm sure you're aware that. Um, to have beef or milk in Cuba is incredible. So let alone to sacrifice a bull would be outlandish. Um, but that is the legacy that we have. And Luis was telling me about San Fan Gong in his guise as Chang'o, that Chang'o visited other lands, he visited Asia, he visited everywhere he went and he deposited these tamarind trees. Because we think of tamarind, we know of it as being very Indian, being very Mexican through the cuisine and the culture, but actually it's from Africa. And I found that this was a real symbolic focal point that, okay, the cabildo is crumbling, we have some new possibilities uh, with, between America and Cuba, and I wonder what will be made of this tamarind tree of Luis and all of these Chinese Cuban descendants today. Thank you very much.